One of the things that literally blows the minds of many who are introduced to quantum physics is the concept of wave-particle duality. It is often incorrectly stated as follows. Light is both a wave and a particle simultaneously. And this sounds not just paradoxical, but like some mockery of logic and common sense. However, there is no mockery at all. The interpretation of wave-particle duality is actually incorrect, and it is more accurate to say that light is neither a wave nor a particle, but represents something third, which in certain circumstances can exhibit wave-like properties to observers and particle-like properties in other situations. This perspective is much more correct and accurate from a physical point of view, though it explains little about the essence of the matter. In this video, we will attempt to clarify the issue together. Debates about the nature of light have been ongoing for roughly as long as physics has existed as a science, if not longer. Plato and Aristotle, as well as Epicurus and Ptolemy, debated this topic. One of the founding figures of modern physics, Isaac Newton, was a staunch supporter of the theory that light consists of a stream of particles or corpuscles, as he called them. This theory is also known as the emission theory, corpuscular theory, or ballistic theory, as it posits that the propagation of light in space is purely a ballistic process of transition of luminous particles with mass and momentum. In contrast, René Descartes, for example, believed that light has a wave nature and propagates in space similar to how ocean waves spread on the water surface and sound waves propagate in the air. In the early 19th century, English physicist Thomas Young conducted his famous double-slit experiment by passing monochromatic light through a screen with two narrow slits, which then fell onto a target screen. Corpuscular ballistic theories predicted that in such an experiment, the second screen would display two illuminated bands, as if representing the slits on the intermediate screen. However, in reality, Young observed an alternating pattern of several dark and light bands of gradually decreasing brightness, precisely as predicted by the wave theory of light. Results of experiments in physics are generally treated with respect, and for the next 100 years, the concept of the wave nature of light prevailed over the corpuscular one, meaning the consensus in physics became that light is an electromagnetic wave. However, by the end of the 19th century, evidence began to accumulate that everything about light might not be so straightforward. Building on the wave theory of light, British physicists John Rayleigh and James Jeans derived their famous law describing the radiative emission of heated bodies. According to this law, a body heated to a temperature T would emit electromagnetic radiation, including light, over a wide range of frequencies and wavelengths. The energy for each wavelength would be described by the rayleigh genes law. Unfortunately, this law, derived from the assumption that light is an electromagnetic wave, did not hold in practice. According to it, the energy density of radiation from a body at a given temperature should have grown indefinitely with increasing frequency. And moreover, if one attempted to obtain the total energy emitted by the body at all frequencies by integrating the expression over frequency from zero to infinity, an infinite value would be obtained. However, a body heated to a finite temperature should not emit infinite energy. This paradox became known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. Furthermore, experiments showed that real emission spectra did not closely resemble the predicted formula of the rayleigh genes law. They exhibit a maximum at a certain temperature, beyond which the intensity of emission rapidly decreases. In 1893, Wilhelm Wien empirically derived his law of the emission of heated bodies based on experimental data. However, while this law described the process of emission well, it did not explain why it occurred. Only in 1900 did Max Planck, one of the founders of quantum physics, manage to solve this puzzle. He hypothesized that light is emitted not as a continuous stream, but in discrete packets, where the energy of each packet is directly proportional to the frequency and inversely proportional to the wavelength. Based on this assumption, Planck derived his own law of radiation, which turned out to be precisely in line with observed phenomena. Planck called the packets of radiation quanta. The second phenomenon that also defied explanation in the wave theory of light was the so-called problem of the redshift of the photoelectric effect. 
The photoelectric effect is the ability of electromagnetic radiation to eject electrons from atoms and matter in general. Today, this phenomenon is applied, for example, in solar panels. The physics of the effect was generally understood. Radiation imparts energy to an atom, which may be large enough for one or more of its electrons to overcome the electrical attraction to the nucleus and fly away. Obviously, this process should occur when the energy transmitted to the atom by radiation is greater than or equal to the binding energy of the electron in the atom. The energy of radiation, in turn, is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the wave oscillations. Therefore, one could expect that the photoelectric effect would depend primarily on the intensity of light. However, it turned out that the photoelectric effect also depended on the frequency and wavelength of the radiation. At wavelengths greater than a certain critical wavelength and frequencies lower than a certain critical frequency, the photoelectric effect ceased to occur, no matter how much the intensity of light was increased. This did not fit into the wave theory, but it correlated well with the theory of the quantization of electromagnetic radiation proposed by Planck. That is, it seemed that light is not only emitted, but also absorbed in quanta, the magnitude of which depends on the frequency of the radiation. In other words, an atom could only absorb one quantum of radiation at a time, and electron ejection could only occur if the energy contained in this quantum was above a certain threshold value. In studying the emission of light by bodies, it was found that it is emitted in quanta, and in studying the absorption of light, it was concluded that it is also absorbed in quanta. Therefore, it was logical to assume that between emission and absorption, light also exists in the form of quanta or particles, which were later called photons. Thus, the actual flow of light was assumed to consist of a large number of photons, each very small, collectively creating the illusion for observers that they are dealing not with a rain of particles, but with a continuous flow of energy. However, when examining processes at the atomic and subatomic levels, where very small energy portions are involved, the quantum nature of light becomes evident. This theory explained all observed phenomena, with one exception. It was unclear how the stream of photons acquires wave properties, the existence of which in light was reliably confirmed in Young's experiment. This was understood only much later, when it was found that any stream of subatomic particles and even individual particles, possesses wave properties. This was experimentally demonstrated in 1927 by George Thomson and Joseph Davison, who showed the diffraction of electrons as they pass through matter. As a result of scattering on the crystalline lattice of matter, electrons produced essentially the same diffraction pattern on the screen that Young observed in his light experiment. If Young's experiment led physicists to acknowledge wave properties in light, then a similar experiment with electrons proved that particles themselves also possess wave properties. This can be explained as follows. As known in quantum mechanics, there is a principle of uncertainty that prohibits precisely measuring the coordinate and velocity, or more precisely, the momentum of a particle. That is, any particle whose velocity we know even a little will have a slightly uncertain position in space. In simpler terms, we cannot firmly say that a particle is in a certain point, but must acknowledge that there is a probability of finding it in a particular volume of space. Therefore, it makes sense to talk about the distribution of such a function in space. The distribution of the values of any physical quantity in space is called the field of values of that quantity. In other words, we are dealing with a field of probabilities of finding a particle. The position of the particle corresponds to the disturbance of this field, and the movement of the particle corresponds to the movement of the disturbance in the field. The movement of the disturbance of the field in space is nothing else but a wave. However, in the case of, for example, a sound wave, we talk about disturbances spreading in the space of the medium, and in the case of an electromagnetic wave, we talk about disturbances of the electric and magnetic field intensities. Here, we have a wave of probability, or more precisely, a wave of the probability density of finding a particle in a given area of space. Thus, in a sense, it can be said that no particles exist at all. There are only disturbances traveling through space in the field of probability density, indicating the likelihood of finding a particle. 
Hence, the fact that all quantum objects must possess wave properties becomes evident. Since we are dealing with fields and waves of probability, in a specific experiment, we can always detect the same electron in a specific point in space. At that point, the electron will exhibit specific mass, charge, and other characteristics, behaving like an ordinary particle. However, between observations, it will behave like a wave. Its propagation from one observation point to another will not resemble the trajectory of a solid ball, but rather the spread of a probability wave, indicating the likelihood of detecting that particle. Can we similarly envision photons, i.e. light quanta, as elementary disturbances in some photon field? Not only can we, but we must. If carefully calculated, this photon field turns out to be nothing other than the electromagnetic field. Thus, we return to the starting point. A photon, as a particle, is also an elementary portion of electromagnetic radiation, and the flow of such particles is, in essence, a wave. On the other hand, the electromagnetic field fundamentally represents nothing more than a characteristic of the probability of finding a photon in a given point in space. This principle forms the basis of quantum electrodynamics, where electromagnetic interaction is essentially described as a process of exchanging photons between a charged particles, and the charge, from a fundamental perspective, describes how much a particle affects the saturation of the photon field in a specific point in space. Therefore, the concept of particle wave duality can be reformulated as follows. Any wave, i.e. any disturbance in the field intensity of a particular fundamental interaction, can be represented as a stream of particles, quanta of that interaction. However, each of these particles, like any quantum object, will possess wave properties, endowing the entire stream with wave properties as well. When we examine phenomena on a scale where individual quanta are not distinguishable, it is more convenient and appropriate to speak in terms of fields, waves, etc. However, if we decrease the scale of size and time intervals, the corpuscular quantum properties become more apparent, and reasoning in terms of particles becomes more appropriate. In other words, Yes, light can be considered as a wave, but it is crucial to remember that this wave consists of individual particles. It can also be regarded as a stream of particles, with the understanding that these particles possess wave properties. Since ordinary particles familiar to us on a macroscopic scale, such as grains of sand, are not expected to have wave properties, and familiar waves, such as sound waves, are not expected to exhibit particle-like properties, we say that quantum objects are neither waves nor particles. Instead, they possess properties of both and represent something entirely different, for which our language lacks a distinct term. By the way, one of the very relevant problems in modern physics is that we haven't yet figured out how to apply the concept of particle wave duality to gravitational interaction. While we can describe the gravitational field fairly well, and we have even detected gravitational waves, Describing it as a stream of particle quanta and calculating gravitational effects on scales typical for subatomic particles has proven challenging. This doesn't mean we're not trying. Currently, physicists have several promising candidates for a quantum theory of gravity. However, we'll save that extremely interesting topic for one of our future videos. For now, farewell and until our next encounter.